Welcome back to History on a Hawk. I'm Captain Boss. I've been looking into the mysterious airplane disappearance of Le Sol Blanc, or the White Bird, and its two famous French pilots, Charles Nungesser and Francois Colli. It was the only European aircraft entry into the great aviation race of 1927. The winner of that race would receive the Ortega Prize, which was a $25,000 cash prize awarded to the first aircraft to complete a non-stop flight from New York to Paris, or vice versa. The White Bird departed Paris on May 8th and was expected to arrive in New York on May 9th, but she never made it. Obviously, she crashed. But where? Most researchers believe she crashed into the sea. But many theorize she may have crashed in southern Newfoundland, or perhaps, according to many witnesses, in Down East Maine, in the vicinity of Round Lake, near the Canadian international border. Most researchers agree that the White Bird had successfully crossed the Atlantic during the night of May 8th and the morning of May 9th, 1927, and had reached northern Newfoundland, picking up its coastline and flying south. The crew, flying just over the tops of the waves due to the fog and poor visibility, probably saw Nova Scotia in the distance and flew along its western coastline, then perhaps picking up the main coastline in the distance and turned that way. But as they crossed the Bay of Fundy, the weather continued to worsen and the flight visibility deteriorated even more. With very poor weather conditions, the pilots probably descended down to treetop level, hoping to pick up some landmarks so they could figure out their location. In the early days of aviation, pilots had to rely only on their eyesight and other human senses in order to keep the airplane level. They had to look outside at the ground and the horizon. So when low-lying clouds and fog were in the path of the aircraft, the pilots of the day would turn to avoid them, even if it meant turning around and going back to where you started from and wait for better weather. So if an airplane of this era entered into the clouds or had to contend with low-lying fog in their flight path, it was an emergency and it could lead to crashing and dying. Attitude indicators, artificial horizons, and turn indicators, and then later aviation radio beacons that allowed pilots to steer towards their destination and maintain attitude control and poor visibility and fog, wouldn't be invented until 1929, two years after the White Bird's disappearance. The White Bird had none of these flight aids in 1927. They hadn't been invented yet. These two French pilots were literally flying by the seat of the pants, using only human senses to stay level. And they're extremely unreliable. Even the most technologically advanced aircraft coming out of the First World War didn't have any of these basic flight instruments yet. They only had a simple magnetic compass and a map. That was it for navigation. So this was the world that the White Bird was flying in in the early morning hours of May 9th, past Newfoundland, flying low towards the main coast. The fog was thick, flight visibility was low, no attitude indicator, and they had no idea where they were on a map because they couldn't make out any landmarks. They were probably dead reckoning and were now way off course and lost. In my opinion, I believe that after seeing how thick the fog was at treetop level and seeing how low their remaining fuel was getting, they decided to make an emergency water landing on the first large enough lake or bay that they could land on. There they would sit it out until the weather improved and hopefully find some extra fuel the next morning so they could continue. It was at this point that they probably realized that they would not succeed and win the Ortega Prize. But that probably was not that important at this point in the flight. 
They were in dire straits, and they knew it. So I think they were hoping that the visibility would improve slightly and praying for a hole in the clouds to open up near a lake or any body of water so that they could descend through it and make a water landing. Sucker holes we call them today because they make suckers out of pilots. The terrain in Maine is dotted with countless small lakes. So there were all kinds of water where the French pilots could have attempted to land on. But many of these lakes have a nasty surprise. They are deceptively shallow and full of subsurface rocks. If they hit them, it could easily rip an airplane fuselage apart. Any float plane pilot will tell you that. It's one of their biggest concern when making a water landing on a lake. That's what I think they did. They picked out a lake to land on, Round Lake, and they set up to land on it. As they made their approach, they were probably too low. So low that they may have clipped some trees, maybe like this one. And I also think they were probably flying too fast to land safely on it. If you land a seaplane too fast and too steep, the water surface is as hard as concrete and it will shatter a fuselage. So I think the French pilots hit the water hard and fast, hit an underwater rock, and the plane disintegrated. And I think the pilots were killed instantly upon impact. That's what I think happened. The pilots were killed instantly upon impact. Their bodies got stuck in the wreckage as the plane sunk into the mud at the bottom of the lake. And they disappeared into oblivion. A mystery that has never been solved. Two and a half weeks after their disappearance, Charles Lindbergh would be successful in his non-stop New York to Paris attempt, and he instantly became a worldwide celebrity and the world's most famous pilot. And poor Nungesser and Koli would be thrown into the trash heap of history, mostly forgotten. Incredibly sad, really. Lindbergh's fame began almost instantly upon his landing in Paris, literally overnight, and his celebrity would grow exponentially in the years that follow. But his success and fame were due, in large part, to the illustrious failure of Nungesser and Koli. Lindbergh would later regret the excessive scrutiny and fame that would be thrust upon him in the years and decades following his feat. But it would also make him very rich. He began working with Pan Am almost immediately after his return from Paris in working out a transatlantic flight route for the early flying boats of the era. And within 10 years, regularly scheduled flying boats were in operation. But for Nungesser and Koli, the memory of their attempt would fade from history. We must never forget the sacrifice that these two men made or of the historical significance of their aircraft, Le Sol Blanc or the White Bird. Combined, they pushed aviation technology forward by leaps and bounds and helped create a mystique about this era of early aviation. We owe a huge debt of gratitude that these men lived and attempted this harrowing feat. Let's not forget them. In the meantime, the mystery continues. Where is the white bird? So many have tried to find her, but with no success. Maybe you can go out and find her. This concludes my investigation into the disappearance of the white bird. I hope you enjoyed watching the series. Thanks for watching History on a Hog. I'll see you next time. And remember, ride safe.